Welcome to another edition of the Pipeline Podcast presented by Ruoff Mortgage. As always, I'm your host, Dylan Tyre, and we are getting into our draft talk. We're done discussing Blue Jackets prospects. We're done talking with Blue Jackets prospects. Now it's all about the NHL entry draft. Of course, before that, we've got the draft lottery coming up on Monday, May 8th. The Blue Jackets have the second best odds at securing the number one overall pick. That's presumed to be Connor Bedard, but they are guaranteed a top four pick in the NHL entry draft if they don't secure that number one overall selection. So here to talk about all the Blue Jackets possibilities is Chris Peters, a recurring guest on the Pipeline podcast. Chris is a senior content creator for Flow Hockey. This guy knows everything there is to know about the NHL draft and the prospects involved. Chris, thanks very much for being with us again. Well, Dylan, thank you for the kind introduction. It's great to be with you. All right. I want to start off in general terms talking about the 2023 NHL entry draft. How does this draft compare to the last two where the Blue Jackets had high first round picks? Of course, a couple years ago, it was Kent Johnson at five, Cole Stillinger after that. Corson Kuhleman's at 25th overall. Last year, David Yurichek at 6th overall. Denton Matejchuk at 12th. How does this draft compare in terms of the talent at the top? Yeah, you know, I think especially compared to last year, you know, it's 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 a it's it's quite different. It's 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 night and day almost because of you know you've obviously got Connor Bedard, which you know is is a special player that had one of the best draft seasons that you could ever possibly have. Adam Fantilli, who had one of the best draft seasons that you could possibly have at the collegiate level uh, with only Jack Eichel and, and Paul Correa, the only other comparables to him in terms of the quality of season that he had. Um, and then, you know, also, I think the the top four as a whole is really exciting with you've got, you know, Maffei Mitchkov, Leo Carlson, that's kind of your consensus top four. So, you know, I would say um, it's because of that, the top of that, sorry, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> sorry uh allergy season um you know but the uh but the um you know be, beyond that i think that the first round as a whole there's a lot of depth there's a lot of variety um it's a very good year to be looking for forwards uh you know in protect compared to previous seasons you know we saw had some really great draft uh eligible defensemen the blue jackets happen to get two of the top three that i had on my list um you know and then this year you don't want to be looking for a top tier defenseman because i don't think there's one to be found there might be one maybe two top four upside defensemen um but it's also a good year for goaltending there's a lot of high end goalies with with good upside that'll be available from the late first into the second and third rounds um so you know that gives you a lot of variety so i think that's what makes this draft exciting it's is is it is it a ton deeper than your, your average draft? Probably not. You know, I think it's probably similar to that, but if you're at the very top of the draft, you have a chance to get a franchise building block out of one of the first four, maybe even the, you know, going further down the list um, in this particular year where you're going to be able to get a franchise building block, which is a pretty special place to be in and, and where you hope you can, you know, if you're going to be picking a very high in the draft, that's what you hope you can leave with. Yeah, that's it's very exciting to hear that. That's, of course, what the Blue Jackets are looking for at the top of this draft. Again, they will be selecting in the top four. Uh, hopefully, if everything goes right for them, they'll be selecting number one overall and drafting a player by the name of Connor Bedard. You and I talked about Connor Bedard ahead of the World Junior and kind of the comparison between he and Adam Fantilli. At that point, there were conversations where, hey, is Fantilli going to challenge Connor Bedard to be the number one overall pick? I think Connor Bedard quieted those conversations <laughs> with the historic performance he put up at the World Junior. You know, most points, most goals, most assists in a single World Junior for Team Canada. He's the record holder all time for Team Canada in a World Junior with goals and points. Just how special is Connor Bedard? Boy, uh, I mean, how many ways can you put it, really, honestly? I mean, you look at the numbers and certainly – they're astronomical. I mean, like, you know, it's it's hard to even compare it. Sidney Crosby had an amazing pre-draft season. Uh, Connor McDavid had an amazing pre-draft season. But, you know, I think when you combine the fact that there were two World Juniors in this year, uh, that, that Connor Bedard going back to the summer World Juniors, um, you know, the fact that he basically put a mid-tier WHL team on his back and got them into the playoffs and got them to a game seven in the first round um, is another thing that shows just how special he is so i think we we witnessed one of the best ever draft seasons by a player i mean you know i think you'd have to maybe even go back to mario lemieux 
to think about, you know, he had like 200 plus points in, in, and we're talking about a completely different era of hockey as well. I'm um, in a different depth of talent that we're talking about. So, you know, when you kind of look at the era and you look at, you know, the, the way the team that, that Connor Bedard played on, cause he wasn't on one of those top tier teams where producing points was just going to be automatic. You know, he basically had, you know, 140 point season and had goals upon goals upon goals um, and, you know, just really torched everything. So, to, to put it in, you know, the only way to really put it into context is just to continue to look at the numbers. Averaging over two and a half points per game is, you know, Crosby level in terms of production. It's better than what McDavid did in his draft season, though, the, you know, there were a couple of things that he broke his hand at the, the season. There were, there were some mitigating factors. But at the same time, when we talk about the level of dominance, you know, I think that Connor Bedard had one of the, the great, great seasons ever. The one caveat I do want to include in that is that having a great junior season doesn't necessarily translate to being an automatic, amazing NHL player. But I do think that Connor, like, I don't think Connor Bedard is going to be Connor McDavid in terms of level of impact. I do think he is going to be a special, you know, perennial all-star potential future hall of famer kind of player because he is, you know, at, at, at least a generational goal scorer. You might say he's, you know, generational in nature in terms of what he did this season. A big thing that the Blue Jackets are in search of is that number one centerman. Connor Bedard does play center, but is he an NHL center? You know, I, I think he probably is. You know, I, I think that at his size, it definitely there aren't many. We, we had this discussion about Jack Hughes. We had this discussion, you know, guys like Braden Point had to overcome that kind of you know concerns about their size um and that's really the only thing holding connor back i think his intelligence his 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 pace um his competitiveness you know the fact that he has worked really hard to strengthen his body and and especially his lower body i mean he's he is he has some real drive to his uh to his lower half there and that allows him to compete with bigger stronger players and he was knocking guys off pucks you know throughout the playoffs and um you know so it's just you know the wear and tear so i think yes he can the question is, is, you know, especially early in his career, it doesn't, there's no rule that says he has to play center his entire NHL career. And also I think that the way that forward groups are structured in the NHL, everybody has their responsibilities and the position doesn't necessarily matter as much, but certainly center when you, you have to have a center, that's going to be, take all those defensive responsibilities, take all of the different, you know, things that come with being a center. And the question is, is, you know, do, how much, at the NHL level, does Connor Bedard's offense suffer for having to do some of the things that he does at some of the things that a center has to does to, has to do guys like Connor McDavid. It obviously doesn't have any impact. Braden point, same thing. He was able to be a 50 goal scorer. You know, there are all these different things that, that kind of come into play. Um, but I do think that for him, you know, odds are because he's such a play driver, he'll remain a center. Um, he might start on the wing and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, he's probably, you know, he could be a 30 to 40 goal score as a rookie, the way that he scores now. Um, I think it'd be a lot easier for him to potentially accomplish that if he were on the wing. Uh, but I think it's just going to come down to a team that wants to where, where they're at in their development as a, as a franchise, what kind of support they have around him. Um, you know, and I think you, if you look at a team like Columbus in particular, it's kind of a great situation because they've had, they've built up their prospect system, but there are already veteran players in place in positions where you can support a player like Connor Bedard. So that's kind of where you say, okay, well, this is, they're, they're in a bit of a different situation than a lot of the other teams that kind of were in the bottom of the standings this year where, you know, they're, they're a little bit earlier in their, their rebuilding process. Whereas Columbus kind of, it was, it was kind of a, 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 a series of unfortunate events essentially that put them where they were. And now you have this opportunity to really get a franchise changer, whether it's him or Fantilli or even any of the other guys. But yeah, I mean, Bedard is, is, is special. And I think, you know, long-term he'll play down the middle. 90 goals in 71 games this season between the WHL regular season and playoffs and the Winter World Junior. You've already brought up names like Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid. And whenever you say the name Connor Bedard, those two names always seem to follow. First of all, are those comparisons fair? You just said that you don't think Connor Bedard will have the same impact on the National Hockey League the way that Connor McDavid does. But are those comparisons still fair? And you know, I know this might be tough to do, but does Connor Bedard remind you of anyone past or present in the National Hockey League? Yeah, you know, I, I think of the guys that 
that he plays most like. I feel like Steven Stamkos is probably the most direct comparable to him. Um, just as a as a high end goal scoring talent, you know, Stamkos had a sixty goal NHL season. Um, you know, because and also I don't think you know he necessarily he doesn't play at the pace of a of a McDavid. He doesn't you know play it have the all around game of a Sidney Crosby. And that's really where, you know, I think that the, the issue is, is that, you know, McDavid is a freak of nature who skates like nobody else on earth. And that's kind of, you know, that's the separating factor between him and everything else. And also he processes the game at a speed that is incredible. Um, that, you know, the, if he was just that fast, it wouldn't matter because his brain wouldn't work fast enough to keep up his does. Um, so it's hard to say, cause like, I think stylistically you could see a lot of different little elements of things like, you know, especially, Bedard's hockey intelligence overall and, and understanding of, of time and space. But to me, I think, I, you know, I definitely look at, at, at a guy like if he has a Stamkos level impact, that's a hall of fame impact practically. I mean, you know, the guy that's captain multiple Stanley cup teams and, you know, had m multiple 60, 50 goal seasons, you know, that's pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, but, but I think that's, that's going to be the challenge for a lot of us is that there are so many, you know, physically, Connor Bedard is different from Sidney Crosby and from Connor McDavid to a certain degree. Um, you know, skating wise, it's a little bit of a difference from McDavid. He's probably in a similar realm as, as Crosby with the feet and things like that. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to quantify because we, we've only seen him dominate really, you know? And, and so it's, it's kind of the expectation is that he's going to come into the NHL and he's going to be an immediate impact player. Um, whether it's going to be to the same degree as as a Sidney Crosby, who had you know had over 100 points as a as a rookie, that might be a lot to ask for, um, you know, because especially since 100 point scores just are rare at this point. Um, but you know, I, I do think that there is a lot there that suggests we're talking about an abnormal rookie, you know, a guy that is going to do something very special next season, um, just because he's so intelligent and so you know just so proficient. And every single shot that he takes, you feel like it can go in. And that just does not, there are not many prospects that I've ever watched where it's just like, if he shoots it, it's probably going in, you know, like that's, that's a pretty special trait. All right. Let's talk about Adam Fantilli, because if Connor Bedard didn't exist, Adam Fantilli would in all likelihood be the consensus number one overall pick this year, had an unbelievable Hobie Baker season in his freshman year at the university of Michigan, best player in college hockey, 30 goals, 35 assists, 65 points in just 36 games this season. How big is the gap between he and Connor Bedard? You know, I, I think it's I think it's significant enough, you know, just because of you look at what Connor Bedard did, and there's just nobody that came close in terms of like that level of production. What I would say is, is that if you are viewing Adam Fantilli as a consolation prize, you're undershooting his value because he is and, you know, he has a lot of the traits if, if you know, if Connor Bedard had the physical traits that Adam Fantilli has, we would be talking about the greatest, you know, the greatest player in history, probably. Um, but he doesn't. And Adam Fantilli does him closer to 6'2", 200 pounds, plays the game fast, plays physical, um, you know, has that goal scoring ability, has has a. Um, the understanding of how to make plays makes plays down low. He's a little bit more aggressive physically, a lot more aggressive physically. Honestly, he's got some snarl to that game. So, you know, I think that that's the, the separating factor is, is Adam Fantilli has so many of the traits of a number one center that you're saying, okay, well, this guy is going to set us up for a long time. Um, you know, I think that they're, they're, the where the where the real gap is beyond the physical side is I think that Connor McDavid or Connor Bedard rather is a better processor of the game. Um, which is 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 a, a a significant separating factor, and I would say, you know, if you look at the top four players, Fantilli might be fourth in in that, but he's still that's it's still a very high bar in terms of you know hockey sense and and the relative um, you know the way he processes the game. Cause I mean, sometimes he does, he'll, he'll skate the puck into trouble or he'll, you know, he'll make a play or kind of doesn't give himself a lot of options or he tries to take on too many guys at once, which is, you know, he, at his age, he's never been at a, at a level where he wasn't able to do that effectively. Um, you know, but I think that the, the thing that really strikes me about Adam Fantilli is we've seen tremendous progression in his game. Um, you know, he's been in the United States, he's Canadian born, but he's been in the United States for the last five years, essentially um, started at Kimball Union, uh, which is a prep school out east. And then he went to the Chicago Steel for two years, 
then he went to, you know, college and was dominant. And, and, you know, he was a, an outstanding player in his last year in the USHL. He was the leading goal scorer in his rookie season in the playoffs. Um, So, you know, and, and, and helped Chicago win a championship that year. So, you know, he's done so many things and accomplished so much. And even, you know, this Michigan team, they lost so many guys. I mean, Kent Johnson obviously was, was a big part of that team, but they also had Owen Power, Matty Beneers, Thomas Bordalo was gone, Brendan Brisson. I mean, they lost six guys that ended up playing in the NHL, Nick Blankenberg as well. You know, so they lose that, and then they bring in this kid, and he's able to essentially – take the place of multiple of those players in terms of his production and what he ultimately accomplished you know he missed five games so he actually outproduced jack eichel's freshman season in a per game basis a 1.88 points per game is you know it's far greater than what what jack eichel accomplished and really you, you know you have to go back to paul korea who essentially had two points a game uh over two points a game as a as a freshman at maine um on a super team by way by the way um, that, you know, that's that's what we're talking about. So, I mean, Adam Fantilli is a very special player. When I say, you know, I, I kind of wrote it even, I think it was back in October. I was like, this guy's not a consolation prize. Don't call him that because, you know, he is he has the potential to be a franchise building block. In the same way, you know, Jack Eichel is the comparable because he had the same draft year as, as Connor McDavid, and it's kind of that similar situation. They were thought to be closer together. One fully pulled up, pulled away. But, you know, even though things didn't work out in Buffalo, as we're seeing in these playoffs, Jack Eichel, very much number one center that can be a franchise building block. So, I mean, that's that's what we're talking about with Adam Fantilli. Those guys, well, Connor Bedard played junior hockey this year. Adam Fantilli played college hockey this year. Leo Carlson, he's kind of the consensus third prospect right now, played professionally over in Sweden, had 25 points in 44 games, one of the most impressive U-20 seasons in that league. What do we need to know about Leo Carlson and where's kind of the gap between he and then Adam Fantilli in front of him? Yeah, I'd say that the gap between Fantilli and Bedard is not as is is uh is is bigger than what we're seeing between him and the other two guy, the other two guys that he's kind of with grouped in in that like not Bedard tier. Um that's still at the very top of this of this draft. And I'd say specifically with Leo Carlson, you know, we're talking about a guy with tremendous size, a guy that can play down the middle. You know, a, a guy that has great hands. Uh, you don't often see that. Um, you know, his feet are okay. They're not amazing. He's not a great skater, but he's a good enough skater at his size. And his, and I think he thinks the game at an incredibly intelligent level. Uh, he understands. I mean, the fact that he put up the points that he did this year in the SHL as a U-20 player on a team where, you know, they weren't necessarily, Arebro is not the, top tier of the, of the league every year. So he's in there and, and making a, a significant impact and played professionally at 16 as well. You know, so this is a guy that's kind of been doing it, improving it. We saw him at the World Juniors this year. Tremendous, out, outstanding performance from him um, at the World Junior Championship was, you know, their best player in some of their most critical games. And again, at his age, you know, just pretty impressive. He even got a look with the senior national team this year for the first time, uh, just a couple of days ago, um, you know, playing in some pre-World Championship exhibitions. I don't know if he's actually going to make the final roster, but at the same time, you know, just just to see what he did this year was pretty awesome. And, and you know, he's he's got, he exudes confidence. I think that he has swagger on the ice too, which is really, I love to see from a young guy that just doesn't, He's not phased by, you know, essentially what, what, what everybody's throwing at him um, in this, in this, in this pro league, like he's bigger, he can shrug it off. He just makes a lot of really clean plays. And so with his talent and his skill level, um, and then on his, and his size on top of that, you know, I think most teams probably would view him as a center. He's played a lot of wing this year. I'm a little more comfortable just based on his pace saying like, hey, he could be a high, high end winger, a top six guy, a guy that plays in the top of your lineup. Um, but, you know, I mean, he's he's just really to me, he's been one of one of the most fascinating players to watch all season because of the level that he achieved at and at at as the, you know, basically a young player in the professional league, you know, 25 points is just insane. So I have a lot of respect for him um, and, and to see what he did this year, 
both at the world juniors and at this SHL level, this is a guy that, that has a chance to, to be another one of those franchise building block type players, maybe to a lesser extent than the other two, because it's not a hundred percent certain that it'll be a center. Um, but I think most teams are projecting him as a, as a center. So I think he's, he's there. Everybody's really excited about him too. All right. The three players that we've discussed so far, all projected as centers in the national hockey league. The last guy in this conversation, kind of the, the consensus one through four, that it's always been these four guys. I want to get to Will Smith in a moment because he's kind of knocking on the door of that conversation, but Matt Michkov, you know, for the last year or so, it's been Connor Bedard and Adam Fantilli won two. For the longest time before that, it was always Connor Bedard versus Matt Vemichkov. We understand the situation in Russia. We haven't been able to see Matt Vemichkov really on the international stage playing against his peers. Because of that, uh, you think back to one of the last times we did get to see that, not including the canceled World Junior, but that U18 where Matt Vemichkov was the best player there. He scored 12 goals. He was better than Shane Wright. He was better than Connor Bedard. Um, but that conversation is kind of quieted around Matt Vemichkov, I think for obvious reasons, but does he still deserve to be in this conversation? Is he that elite player, even though he is projected to play on the wing? Yeah. You know, I, I think if you took away all of, you know, the concerns of drafting Russian players of, you know, the fact that he's under contract for an extended period, you know, there's a, probably a good chance that he's we're we're talking about him more as the number two pick um relative to this to this group as far as hockey intelligence goes he probably is number one in this in this draft at least as far as i'm concerned and it, it part of it is because i've never i've you know i was i was doing the get the broadcasting for that under 18 world championship where he scored 12 goals he was two off of the all-time record by um alex ovechkin at that tournament and um, I had never seen any, like I've been to that tournament many, many times. I'd never seen anything like that in my life um, because he was, it just, you know, he had turnaround shots. He scored a Michigan goal. He scored one between his legs. He he finds so many ways to score goals. Um, you know, the, the big separator and the reason why, you know, he wouldn't necessarily be the lock for number two if, if you took away all of the, the, the Russia and the contract stuff is because of the size. You know, he's, 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 a, he's not a big guy. He doesn't have that explosive skating ability. Um, but, you know, he looks like every time he has the puck, he's a threat to score. Um, and so, you know, he had good numbers in the KHL this year. He got loaned out to Sochi, which I I, I wish more of the, uh, more teams would do that where they loan a player out to another team because they're not getting the minutes. At, and, and that's such an important thing. Um, and you could tell when they made the investment, you know, when, when Scott made the investment in him, they needed him to play. Um, and he wasn't quite ready to play for them yet. Uh, so they move him to Sochi and he takes off. You know, he he was able to produce, he was able to score some big goals for them throughout the season. Now you've got all this other stuff that's on the outside, and it's not just the Russia stuff, you know, tragically his father died. Um, and that is uh obviously, you know, and we, we're getting whatever news we're getting out of Russia and you you're saying, I don't understand fully. Like, you know, was it natural causes? Was it something nefarious? And that like the one thing about these Russian players that we're talking about, there are a lot of real world situations that are going to give teams reasons to say, Hey, like as far as the hockey goes, we got to take a beat and make sure we have all our ducks in a row to, 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 to make this decision. Um, and on top of that, you're also thinking this is a young man that's gone through a very traumatic experience in his life in the biggest year of his life, you know, for at, to this point. Um, and so you also care for the person as well. You care for the person you say, you know, but, but again, when you look at the business side, you say, we, these are all things we have to take into consideration. So if you take away all that ancillary stuff, which is, you can't because it's significant, but if you did, we're talking about one of the most exciting prospects of the last few years in addition to Connor Bedard, in addition to Adam Fantilli and Leo Carlson, this guy is very, very special. And we would be talking about him in much different terms if if the situation were different. But of course, it's not. Will Smith has always hovered around the conversation in the top 10. You know, he's been overshadowed by the four guys we've already discussed all season long, really for the last couple of seasons. But he's very quietly put together one of the most impressive seasons for the U.S. National Development Program of all time. Better numbers than Austin Matthews, better numbers than Jack Hughes. Does this guy deserve to be in this top four conversation right now, along with everybody else? I, I mean, I think I think to a certain extent, yes, because but I mean, I if, if we 
because of the stuff that's going on with Matt Mitchkov, if we didn't have that again, I don't think so. I think the top four is pretty well spoken for. Um, the thing about Will Smith is he's an incredibly dynamic talent. He is, he does so many things with the puck. He's the, the play driving center for the number one line. Every guy in that line has, is, is having essentially a record season. Um, you know, they're, they're at the world championship today. I think each of them had four to five points in the game against Switzerland uh, that, that happened today as we're recording this. And so that was just, it's, it's insane to see that, you know, to see, okay, he has 118 points. Gabe Perot also on his line has 127 or eight points now um, to, to just absolutely smash Austin Matthews previous record of 117. Um, each of them has 40 or more goals. And this also includes Ryan Leonard, who's on the brink of a 50 goal season. Um, you know, so what they've done collectively is pretty special. Um, you know, I think that there's the, the interesting thing about Will Smith is you can talk to a lot of different scouts and they would put not every scout has him as the number one player on his line. Not every scout has him. And, and that's that's the thing where when we get outside of this top four, there's a lot more debate, but it's not because the players are bad. It's because they're all so good, honestly. I mean, because you've got him, you've got, you know, obviously Ryan Leonard, Gabe Perot, Oliver Moore, who's the number two center on that team. Um, and then outside you got guys like Zach Benson and, and, you know, Nate Danielson and, and a number of other players and also some of the European players that are in that discussion as well. But as far as what Will Smith is like, he, he is probably, you know, has maybe the best hands in the draft in terms of his, uh, his ability to, to make guys miss one-on-one -on -one. really an outstanding vision. I think that he's gotten stronger this year. His skating has improved, which was a knock on him before. Um, and then also his his strength, which still needs to get better, has gotten better this year as well. So there's a lot to like about about Will Smith and the group that kind of is around him. Um, so, you know, if you fall, it, the thing is, is all, the only thing that really is is kind of could shift that top four is what order the teams land in and who feels how about Matt V. Mitchkov? Are they willing to wait? Um, you know, so that's, that's going to be the interesting thing to happen, but I think Will Smith is absolutely in that conversation. I think Ryan Leonard is, is in the, is in the number five conversation as well. Um, you know, we saw Matthew Wood from UConn get uh, a big bump in his central scouting ranking. Um, you know, there are a lot of different players that I think, you know, Delibor Dvorsky, uh, uh, Edward Shala. I mean, you know, I don't think that all of those guys are going to compete for that fifth spot, but you know, there's certainly a lot of players that, that are in the discussion and, yeah, if you have a top top four, five, six, seven, eight pick, you're feeling pretty darn good about yourself right now. As far as it goes with Will Smith, does his game remind you of anybody in the NHL past or present? Yeah, I mean, I think I think he plays a lot like Trevor Zegras. You know, I think that there's a lot of that flash and dash. Maybe even I think actually Troy Terry might be a little bit better of the of a comparison just because of you know Troy's score goal scoring ability. because uh, Will has really added that as more of an element, he's become a little bit more of a shooter. He's definitely a pass first player, but he's got 47 goals this year. So, you know, it's how much of a pass first can you be when you have that many goals? But, you know, I think that that, that his ability to be a shot pass threat is, is a little bit more co common in you know, in kind of that Troy Terry range where you're talking about kind of a rangy, a little bit of lanky player that, that has to tack on strength, but really relies heavily on hand skills. And, and I think that's what Will Smith is. There's not a lot of time between now and the draft on June 28th. Well, the first round of the draft, I should say, on June 28th. But is there anybody that could sneak into this top four, top five conversation that we haven't already talked about? There are always late risers, right? Like, it wasn't like Uri Slavkovsky was always going to be the number one overall pick last year. A little bit different of a situation right. there because he was going to be a high pick. But is there a player, maybe it's somebody that we have already talked about, that could really disrupt things? I mean, I think one of the guys that that is is disrupting it right now, um, and and who I've been you know talking with more and more scouts about is 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 Ryan Leonard. Um, you know, and Ryan Leonard is the lowest scoring of the three players on his line. However, he plays a much different style. He's very much he, he's very strong. He's physical. He can change the game in one shift. Essentially, he has dynamic. Uh, hand skills and on top of that he's got a tremendous shot and you know is on the verge of scoring 50 goals this year um you know the, i think because of his his combination of physicality and skill that's why all of a sudden and why i mentioned that we talk about guys like will smith you know not everybody that's watched the ntdp all season is saying that's the number one that's the first guy we would take off of that team um which is no knock on him it's just it just speaks to how dynamic that group has been 
Um, and so I, I do think that of those players, Ryan Leonard has a chance. Certainly Zach Benson, who does not have the size, but he's tenacious. He's hard on the puck. He's got great vision. He makes plays. He played on, you know, or plays on Winnipeg this year in the WHL. And that's always been a team these last couple of years that, that has been, you know, pretty tremendous in terms of their production and, and what they're able to accomplish. So he's another guy that could potentially slide into that range. But, you know, the, one of the guys that's really rising, though, you know, that I keep hearing more and more about is, is, is Ryan Leonard. And that's going to be really interesting to see, um, you know, how that impacts the the top of the draft. And I can't wait to see what order the NTDP forwards go in. And there are four guys that are all legitimate top 15 picks, I think, um, you know, maybe top 20 at, at worst. And that's it's it's going to be fascinating to see the order they go in because of how dominant they've been all season. If you're Yarmo Kekalainen right now, how happy are you given everybody that we've talked about that you've secured yourself a top four pick in the 2023 draft? I mean, I I think I especially because of where the Blue Jackets are right now in terms of their maturation as a franchise and the fact that there is a Johnny Goudreau and the fact that there is a Patrick Laine and that Zach Wierenski will be healthy and that there, you know, there will be other things to figure out, but you got David Juracek on the way. You've got to feel good about Kirill Marchenko, you know, Cole Sillinger, all of these players that have made a significant impact on the roster in some way or another at, you know, either as veteran players, as guys that came in. And now you're able to throw in a high, high end prospect you know, as I was talking to scouting directors this year that were in, you know, their teams were not in a good position. You know, they did. They, they said, as long as we finish in the top four, we're going to be really happy. You know, everybody wants Connor Bedard. No question. Everybody wants the number one guy. You should want the number one pick. But if you don't end up with that, can you still make your team better? And everybody that's within that top four says, without question, we're going to make our team better. Um, you know, so I think that that's the thing. And, and the interesting thing, that I would also say about Columbus is they're uniquely positioned teams that might not be willing to take the gamble on Matt Vemichkov. Maybe Columbus is because there's some insulation there. There's some insulation to, Hey, we have a team that we're happy with. Now we feel like we can compete. We can wait for that player. It's not fun to wait. Nobody wants to wait, but he's the kind of player that I think is worth waiting for. If you feel like the risk, you know, is not the, 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 the reward, Outweigh, outweighs the risk. That's the really the only thing. But I, I'm really fascinated with what what they're going to ultimately do as a group. Um, you know, I think because they they've had so many options, we've seen before that Yarmo is not afraid to go, to buck convention as well. You know, so that's the other thing. There's a lot of different scenarios that can play out. It's always entertaining when the Blue Jackets get to the podium because you just really never know what they're going to do. And as they've shown in the last couple of years, they're usually going to make a pretty good pick. So you know that that's a that's a good position to be in. All right, Chris. Well, I appreciate the time. I have one final question for you. When you and I chatted ahead of the World Junior, you said that Adam Fantilli would be the best fit for the Blue Jackets. In your eyes, you really liked Adam Fantilli for the Blue Jackets. Do you still stand by that? Obviously, Connor Bedard is is that next level, like you'd love to have him, but <laughs> Adam Fantilli would be a pretty good Blue Jacket, I, I surmise. I, I Yeah, I mean, I think, I think either way, you know, certainly – I think Bedard is like, he fits anywhere, you know, like you, you, you make room for him no matter what. Um, the reason that I would say Fantilli is a really good fit though, is because of that hard driving style that he plays. He's going to be the guy that will go in and go get those pucks for Johnny Gaudreau and, and Patrick Liney in addition to being able to score himself, you know? So if you're looking for a guy that has that versatility and, and, you know, I, I just think that he, do, he checks so many of the boxes and that he's, he showed this year, you know, he was able to make, the guys around him better too. And that was a, you know, Gavin Brindley was, is another draft eligible prospect this year. He got moved up to the top line for Michigan. And that really hit his game took off because he was playing with Adam Fantilli. Um, so no matter who plays with him seems to do better. And I think that that's, you know, ultimately to me, you know, when I look at that, that roster as a whole and I say, Hey, let's get a little bit of extra snarl in there as well. That's what he brings. That's something that he brings that you can have at the top of your lineup that not many teams are able to have anymore. The players, a lot of players don't play that way anymore that are those high, high-end players. Adam Fantilli does. So, you know, I think Bedard is the best fit for literally everybody because of what he does. Adam Fantilli makes a ton of sense as a, as a number, a potential number one center, one unlike I think the Blue Jackets have ever had, um, which is really, you know, a special thing to, to, to have and, and, and what you hope you can come out of you know, if you can get a, a top end or a number one center out of your draft, you're going to be thrilled.
All right, Chris Peters, senior content creator and draft expert, prospect expert for Flow Hockey. Thanks so much, as always, for being with us. We really, really appreciate all the insight. Yeah, my pleasure, Dylan. Great to be with you. All right, that'll do it for this week's edition of the Pipeline Podcast. We're going to take a break next week, but we'll be back. Remember, the draft lottery is Monday, May 8th. The next time we chat, we'll know where the Blue Jackets are picking, so we'll be able to zero in on some more prospects. But until then, I'm Dylan Tyre saying thanks for being with me.